What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Hour Podcast, episode 231. Today, we have a very, very intriguing episode for you guys. This topic has just ended up being so interesting to look into. I mean, much more than I even thought. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about uncontacted tribes. And this is some wild shit, people. Which is not even like a very accurate term for these tribes. It's it's indigenous peoples living in voluntary isolation. Yeah. Because that that's the thing is like it's very difficult to go completely uncontacted by a single soul, especially, mm-hmm. you know, as we've aged into the 21st century, you know, people can travel anywhere now very easily, which a lot of these tribes are on these islands and mm-hmm. you know people are starting to you know with drones and everything else it's pretty yeah. in helicopters things like that it's easy to it's getting harder and harder it's getting harder to stay hidden but just we were just talking about this i think in a previous episode how we're like i think it was our one uh, we were talking about robots and kind of where everything the future is going mm-hmm. and it's interesting that with how advanced the world has seemingly gotten that there are a very very primitive lifestyles so like haven't really evolved their practices beyond yeah well they're they don't use any sort of modern technology Mm -hmm. i can't even imagine living that way i think that's what gets me so much about this topic too is it's hard to even imagine what it would be like to not be aware of really anything that's going on in the rest of the world and but maybe that's a good thing i i agree i feel like it's much simpler and closer to haven't been plagued by the internet was but yeah exactly Yep. Yep. But it would just be so interesting to be in their minds for a day and not know about Mm -hmm. brands and celebrities and fashion and politics. You don't know any of that. Their mindset is survive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hunt and gather. Mm -hmm. And that's their day, day in, day out of surviving and, you know, making sure you have shelter, food in your stomach and raising your family, protecting your family. Because there are a lot of threats to these tribes, which we will get into more today. Which, yeah, there, there's a lot of threats. But specifically, we're going to take a look at people who have decided it was a good idea to go and try to make contact with these tribes mm-hmm. for various different reasons and how those encounters didn't necessarily end well Mm-mm. for many of them. Certainly not. But yeah, it's a very, very interesting topic. I mean, just the whole concept of not living in the mm-hmm. you know in remote parts of the world mm-hmm. is, is truly an intriguing one so that's what we're going to get into today we did have an announcement we wanted to make right yes yes i just wanted to remind you guys that we are matching all donations to uh, national center for missing and exploited children and you can make donations via our specific link and that way we can track and match your donation dollar for dollar. And yeah, we're going to be doing that up until the end of the year, up to $50,000. And it's just such a great organization. If you aren't familiar with the work that NECMEC does, they do quite a variety of things. We talk about them often in our, you know, various true crime cases. They come up, they help in so many different cases, and they really do so much to aid in the fight against child exploitation, child victimization, missing children, and more. And the direct link, like I said, to donate will be in the description box and the show notes. And we just love everyone that we have met over at NECMEC. They're such a great team. They really believe in their mission and you can feel good about making your donation that it's going to do really amazing work. And thank you, you know, to everyone who's already made a donation, big or small. Um, whatever you're able to do is so appreciated. So, so far, the website is showing that we have raised $78,531. Nice. That's like quite a bit more than when I last checked it. Yeah. So, yeah, we started this campaign back in May. So some of that is coming from the uh, merchandise that we sell for NECMEC, which 100% of the proceeds from that also goes to them. So we'll have that linked below as well. But, yeah, quite a bit has come in just since we started this new matching initiative. Yeah, That's help, awesome. You help guys. us Thank reach a hundred thousand before the end of the year. That'd be really We're cool. We're gonna do it. That is the mission. Let's do I think it. We can do it. Yeah, because we haven't even matched the donations yet. So that number will come up quite a bit once we calculate, you know, what what has been donated since we started this and match that. Very exciting, guys. Their team is super, super grateful. So thanks again. Anyway, what else? Oh yeah. Our new winter merch collection. It's available at milehiremerch.com. 
Um, and you can order by 1215 to get it in time for the holidays. What are you wearing? Yeah, I'm wearing the mile high er, like <laughs> ire. Like E Y E, because it's got E-Y-E. a cool eye. There's an eye on the bottom here. That was a good name, Janelle. Very creative. Thank you. I like that. I'm really proud of that Mile one. high iron. <laughs> it's kind of hard to say it, but yeah. I love how that one turned out. And then I am definitely wearing one of my favorites in the collection, the Take Your Mind a Mile Higher hoodie. Um, hopefully you can see it pretty good from over there. We'll do overlay pictures as yeah. well, but I love this one. This is my favorite color. Mm. I love green. It's very good. Mm, earthy tones. Yeah. Super really fun. love how these turned out. So yeah, get your hands on them because... We have very limited quantities of these, and we are not restocking this time. No, once we're out, we're done. Yep. We're moving on to the next collection. So if you want one, go get it right now before it sells out. It's milehiremerch.com when we do ship worldwide. All right. You ready to get into things? Yeah, let's just go ahead and jump into this topic here. So let's talk a little bit about just uncontacted tribes in general, which, as we mentioned at the beginning, uncontacted tribes are groups of indigenous people that have had very little to no contact with the outside world. What's interesting is that we don't exactly have a concrete number of how many of these tribes actually exist out in the world, but estimates say that there are between 100 to 200 of them, and there are up to 10,000 people in total that make up these uncontacted tribes. So 100 to 200, and some of those could be as small as like 50, it could be a few hundred, it could be even a thousand or so, but I think it's a mostly smaller numbers of people because I would imagine if you had thousands of people, they probably would have been contacted by now because you need a larger area to live in and hunt and gather in. But I think primarily a lot of these are in both South America and then over um, in like South East, Southwest Asia, which is pretty interesting. And again, like I said at the beginning, to call them uncontacted isn't really the most fitting name because it's almost impossible for these groups to not have had some sort of contact Mm -hmm. with outsiders, even if it's just a helicopter or plane flying over their village, which imagine what that must be like seeing a plane fly over for the first time. You, they must think that it's like something mythological or, you know, maybe, or or, they have some, I don't know. Maybe I'm saying the the first time. Yeah. There's not necessarily information or they have a name for it or it's, you know, they yeah. think it's something other than mm-hmm. what it is, right? Yeah, that's possible, I guess. So, I mean, they've been there for thousands of years. It's probably, you know, a lot of that knowledge is passed down. So it's so interesting to think we are so curious about these groups. However, I wonder how curious they are about us and the outside world. Like, does it, do they have all these burning questions like we do about them and the way they live? Do they wonder? Mm. Do they think about it or is it not really? Or they just don't know, or they just literally don't know that there is life outside of their, where they live, their tribe. That's true. I guess in some cases that could be true. I mean, I'm sure a lot of them, because they've had some sort of contact, they start, you know, these questions start forming. But I think if it were me, I'd be be scared and not necessarily want to Mm -hmm. have those questions answered. Yeah, that's true. For fear of what, what might happen. Everything's been going. Yeah well for so long that why would you want to potentially screw that up by Mm -hmm. going it reminds me of so many so many movies especially like children's movies where it's like you know they i'm trying to think of it a specific example but like like maybe finding nemo for example or something like that where it's like you don't want to go outside of your home and to the great beyond you know and finding Mm -hmm. nemo the outs out in the sea and everything yeah kind of reminds me of of that i don't know why that just came (laughs) in my head maybe because i was just holding my daughter before this but (laughs) but it's just it's kind of that whole concept of, you know, mm-hmm. what's what's all out there and, you know, having this genuine genuine fear of or or even like your parents or and, you know, elders telling you like, oh, you know, telling you story. I'm sure they tell stories of like yeah. things that have they've experienced and you know, I'm sure there's sort of this fear among especially the younger ones in these uncontacted tribes that you know, to kind of keep them within the tribe versus yeah. wanting to go out and be on Moana. Yeah, Moana is another, another example I was just thinking of. <laughs> like uh, legends and stuff. Yeah, it's very possible they could, you know, tell stories like that. Well, they clearly, there's been a few encounters that we're going to talk about that clearly word, you know, of this person's visit 
um, continued yeah. on within the tribe. Well, well that's the thing with it, and that's why the more appropriate term for for these people are indigenous peoples in voluntary isolation mm -hmm. because they have had these contacts, but they're like, we absolutely don't, we're not interested in this contact, so stop bothering us. Yeah. But that doesn't stop people outside From wanting trying. to poke and prod yeah. and try to try to see what's actually going on there. But again, it ends up being a life or death situation most of the time. Mm -hmm. So many people who have tried making contact with these tribes have been met with resistance and violence. And that's because any contact with the outside world would be very dangerous and threaten to wipe these tribes out entirely. Because uncontacted tribes are much more susceptible to disease, as you can imagine. Since they've been living in isolation for so long, their immune systems are not equipped to handle common pathogens and diseases from the outside world. Even one seemingly healthy outside visitor could pass along a common bacteria or virus that could literally wipe out the entire tribe. So even short contact with the outside world could be absolutely devastating. All these tribes have very good reasons to distrust outsiders. Over time, their lands have increasingly been destroyed and disrupted by oil and gas companies, logging, cattle ranchers, miners, and other forms of illegal and legal agricultural businesses. These tribes have also been subject to persistent unwelcome visits from Christian missionaries. Mm. These missionaries try to visit these tribes and convert them to Christianity, all in their quest to spread the word of God. But ultimately, God is not being spread. Diseases are being spread and wiping out these indigenous groups, which literally makes no sense. Why? Why? What's the point of that then? If you're just going to yeah. go, go convert them and then kill them in the process, right. what's the point? Yeah, we'll talk a lot more about this. But the biggest threat to uncontacted tribes is the continued destruction of their ancestral lands. Just the mere presence of outsiders threatens their very existence. One visit from an outsider potentially creates an existential life or death situation for the entire tribe. So it's no wonder that many of these tribes people respond accordingly. They've used deadly force to protect their tribes and although the media has often portrayed them as violent people, this is clearly not a fair characterization. These tribes are acting in self-defense of their people and their land, which is their right. Which obviously one of the reasons we're doing this episode today is because by talking about these tribes and their existence, it's also crucial to their survival. Educating yourselves, educating other people, telling them to leave them alone. It also helps clear up misconceptions that have been used to justify harm done against them. And knowing their history helps ensure that these tribes can protect their right to self-determination. By spreading photos and videos of these uncontacted people, it actually proves that they exist because many governments out there deny that these uncontacted tribes actually do exist. And they do this on purpose because obviously one of the things that they do is sell off of their land and it helps them sort of deny the cruel acts that happen against these tribes. So by saying they don't exist is an easy way to get rid of all of that. Many countries have laws and regulations protecting these tribes and their land. There are also some governmental organizations as well as non-governmental organizations who work to make sure that the rights of these tribes are being protected. But unfortunately, a lot of these organizations are underfunded and year after year their budgets have been slashed. And although many governments have laws protecting the tribes, a lot of times they look the other way when regulations are violated. For example, the rights of indigenous people in Brazil have been continually trampled on by the government. There's a government organization in Brazil to protect indigenous rights called FUNAI or the National Indian Foundation, but their budget has been drastically reduced over the years. And when far-right Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro took over, he started making dramatic changes to the organization that indigenous activists say are devastating. President Bolsonaro has also announced that he has plans to drastically reduce the amount of protected indigenous land. It's his desire to forcibly take the indigenous tribes into Brazilian society and sell their land to agribusiness companies. These kinds of existential threats affect indigenous people all across the globe, especially tribes in isolation. So today we're going to be talking about some of these uncontacted tribes and we'll take a look at their histories, at least what we do know and, you know, what we know about their current life and what's happened with people who have tried to contact these tribes in isolation. It's the most festive time of the year and HelloFresh is here to help make the most of every moment. From holiday hosting to dinners during busy weeknights, you can count on HelloFresh to deliver fresh ingredients and seasonal recipes. Not only that, you can save money as well. HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% less expensive than takeout, so you can use those savings for holiday gifts or treat yourself. My favorite thing about HelloFresh is that the recipes are absolutely delicious, 
but I can get a home cooked meal on the table in 30 minutes or less and cleanup is a breeze. So the whole process itself takes like 45 minutes, which whenever I go and grocery shop, buy ingredients, cook the meal and clean, it's like a two, three hour event. So this cuts it all down and I still get a home cooked, nutritious and delicious meal. I also love the flexibility that HelloFresh gives you both with the meals that you pick, you can add and swap proteins, but also you can stop and start your plan, skip delivery days, and change your address in just a few clicks, which makes it super easy. All the HelloFresh boxes come with pre-measured ingredients. They give you just what you need to make the recipe, and that's it. There's no food waste. So if you haven't tried HelloFresh, now is the time. Go to HelloFresh.com slash MileHire18 and use code MileHire18 for 18 free meals plus free shipping. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash Malhar18 and use code Malhar18 for 18 free meals plus free shipping. So first we will start with the Sentinelese people and they're probably the most famous self-isolated tribe and much of their culture and way of life is still a mystery today. The Sentinelese people live on North Sentinel Island in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands in the Bay of Bengal and the island is technically under India's jurisdiction but the government officials today mostly treat the island as a sovereign nation. So this island is about the size of Manhattan, and it's covered in jungle surrounded by a white, beautiful sand beach. And the population is estimated to be anywhere from 50 to 400 people. But since the tribe is so isolated, we really don't know how many of them there are. I feel like that's one of the common themes you'll see throughout mm -hmm. this episode is, you know, we have some type of estimation and guesses yeah. for these things, but a lot of the times we just don't know if they're correct or not. Because mm -hmm. of the you know sheer fact that these are uncontacted tribes. Yeah, I mean, there's just endless information that we don't know about yeah. them that we wonder about. Um, at least I do. I have so many questions. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's very, very limited. But the Sentinelese people speak their own language, and it hasn't been identified or cracked by the outside world at all, which is very interesting to think about. And their language is completely different from the languages of other neighboring tribes in the Andaman Islands. This suggests that they've actually lived in isolation for quite a long time. In fact, it's estimated that the tribe has lived on the island for over 60,000 years. Again, that's just an estimate, but think about actually having, you know, people survive since th that's really just amazing to think about. The Sentinelese are also thought to be direct descendants of the first human populations in Africa. It's commonly reported that this tribe still lives in the Stone Age, but after tens of thousands of years, there's no doubt that they've adapted their culture and practices over time. For example, the Sentinelese commonly use iron and metal debris that wash up on the island, and they make you know arrows and spears out of that. They survive by hunting animals like pigs and turtles, and the island has shallow lagoons that are perfect for fishing. And the Sentinelese also harvest plants and roots for food as well. And a common rumor floating around is that the tribe practices cannibalism, but this is not true. There's no evidence for this rumor, and incidents on the island point to the fact that the tribe actually buries their dead. There's also rumors about the Sentinelese using poison arrows, but this is not backed up by any evidence. The Sentinelese are thought to live in three small bands. They construct two different types of dwellings. The first is a large covered communal hut, with hearths fit for multiple families, and the second are smaller open air shelters fit for one nuclear family. Since the tribe is so isolated, they have been shielded from outside disease, and the tribe's people look to be in very good health, and pregnant women are spotted frequently, meaning their population is being replaced. The women wear fiber strings around their waists, necks, and heads, and the men wear thicker waistbands, but also wear fiber headbands and necklaces, and they also carry spears, bows, and arrows. The tribe is protected by the Indian government. It is against the law to try to make contact with this tribe or visit North Sentinel Island altogether. And because of this, the Indian Coast Guard and the Navy patrol the waters around the island to prevent illegal visitors. Ships are not allowed to go more than three nautical miles near the island. And as of 2017, it's also illegal to take photographs or videos of the tribe. The government has decided to keep a hands-off but eyes-on approach to the tribe. They decided not to make any more contact attempts. They just basically protect them from afar. And they have pretty good reasons to stay away from the island based on previous events. The Sentinelese tribe is famously very hostile to 
any kind of intruders or visitors. And this might be because of a disastrous visit by a British naval officer in the late 1800s. The officer was a 19-year-old aristocrat named Maurice Vidal Portman. Maurice lived on Port Blair, which was a British penal colony in southern South Andaman Island, while India was under colonial rule. Maurice was in charge of overseeing the island, and he and a group of soldiers decided to do an expedition on the island. Sounds like a bad idea. And it was. At first, all they found were some huts, weaponry, and pig skulls. But later on, he encountered the tribe's people themselves, who he described as painfully timid. Maurice was so intrigued by them that he and his soldiers actually kidnapped a group of tribes people. Absolutely insane. And the group that he kidnapped included an elderly man, his wife, and four children. The elderly man tried to shoot the invaders with a bow and arrow, but Maurice had a prisoner jump on him. So after he captures these six people, he takes them back to his home in Port Blair and held them captive. And over the next few days, the elderly man and his wife quickly became sick and died. After this, Maurice returned the four children to North Sentinel Island, but with some gifts. And he declared that his experiment was a failure. He wrote that the only result was that the tribe would now be terrified of and very hostile towards any outsiders. Maurice concluded that the Sentinelese should be left alone. Maurice also took a series of disturbing photographs of kidnapped Andamanese people during his time in that region. And he must have had some type of sick erotic fixation on these people and the different tribes. I had heard that he was like taking photos of their genitals and yeah, stuff and he's putting sicko. them in weird sexual positions and things yeah. like that. Just fucking so bizarre. So it seems like this story of Maurice has been passed down orally through the generations because even after decades have passed, the Sentinelese immediately respond to outside visitors with hostility. We don't know for sure if Maurice was the reason that the Sentinelese people reject outsiders today, but his sick actions clearly could not have helped. Plus, other neighboring tribes who were colonized by the British were also wiped out by the introduction of disease. And while there have been some friendly interactions in the past century, most other visitors have been greeted by bows and arrows. In the 1970s, there were some expeditions conducted by the Indian government near the island. In one expedition, they left behind two pigs and a doll for the Sentinelese. The tribe responded pretty swiftly by spearing the pigs and the doll and burying them. In 1974, the Indian government came back to the island to try and befriend the tribe. The ship was guarded by policemen with shields, and they also brought along film crews from National Geographic who were trying to make a documentary. The Sentinelese did not welcome the crew. One tribesman shot an arrow towards the ship, and the boat then landed on a deserted beach and left the gifts on shore. Here's a clip of how the Sentinelese responded to those gifts. In his dream, the hunter's triumphant spear gouges the eye of the moon, and when he wakes, the victim is his love. A member of our film unit was wounded by one of the many arrows, each two and a half meters long. He will carry this scar till his death. It was actually one of the National Geographic crew members who was shot in the leg with an arrow, and after this happened, the ship retreated. But that wouldn't be the last time the North Sentinel Island had some unwanted visitors. In 1981, a freighter actually ran aground in a barrier reef near the island, and the tribe was not happy. Fifty or so armed Sentinelese men waving arrows on the nearby beach scared the freighter's crew. They immediately radioed in for backup, and that was a very scary night for them as they didn't think they were going to survive. Due to bad weather, though, the Sentinelese couldn't reach the ship. The freighter was actually stranded for almost a week before they were rescued by helicopter. During the 80s, more attempts to contact the Sentinelese were made, and teams would try to land and leave gifts for the tribe. Sometimes the tribe responded with what looked like friendly gestures, and other times they would just take the gifts, retreat into the jungle, and then return to fire arrows at the teams. In 1991, there actually were some successful friendly expeditions. On January 4th, 1991, anthropologists on an expedition saw a group of Sentinelese people gesturing and waving at them as if they were showing that they wanted gifts. Once the boat was at a safe spot, a crew member dropped off a bag of coconuts and pigs. The Sentinelese came down and grabbed the bag, 
and apparently these anthropologists had made these successful drops before. But this time was different. The Sentinelese hadn't brought any weapons to the shore, and when the crew opened up another bag of coconuts and threw them in the water, five of the Sentinelese swam out to collect them. The anthropologist gestured for them to come closer, but the five got nervous and returned to the shore. The group later returned that afternoon, and this time over 24 Sentinelese people were waiting for them on shore. One of the men pointed a bow and arrow at the crew, but suddenly a woman pushed the bow down. The man then buried his weapons in the sand. Many of the Sentinelese people hopped in the water while the team tossed some coconuts to them, and some of the crew even hopped in the water and gave the tribe's people coconuts hand to hand. We've got some video footage of that first friendly interaction. They're curious too, at least he is. Mm -hmm. They're taking the coconuts and throwing them back on the beach. Yeah, they're just collecting all the coconuts. The kids look very curious. But a fairly friendly interaction, it seems, yeah. <laughs> Someone threw one at her. Look at the kid, he's like, ah! <laughs> Yeah, overall, I mean, it seems like they're intrigued. Definitely. It's really cool footage. Obviously, this visit was considered a success, but the Sentinelese quickly reminded the outsiders about boundaries on their next visit. The anthropologist who had led years of expeditions brought his crew near the shore on a dinghy. While the anthropologist was on shore, the dinghy full of his crew started to float away. One of the Sentinelese men saw this and threatened the anthropologist with a knife. They probably believed the dinghy floating away was a sign that the anthropologist was staying behind and clearly they didn't want that to happen. But luckily, he was able to board the ship safely, and the crew left. So after this encounter, anthropologists and government officials still believed it would be better to just leave the tribe alone. For the most part, the only contact the Sentinelese had with the outside world was when aircraft flew over the island to make sure the tribe had survived natural disasters, much like the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami. I know, imagine what that was like for them. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they survived that. How did yeah. they survive that? We don't know. And I wonder if some people didn't. I mean, right. Good chance. In 2006, two Indian poachers took a boat out near the island to illegally hunt for mud crabs, lobsters, and sea cucumbers. The two men reportedly got drunk off palm wine after a day of poaching and dropped their anchor for the night. But the anchor was faulty, and the drunk fishermen started to drift towards the shore of North Sentinel Island. They were warned by other nearby poachers, but the boat drifted to the shore anyway. While other poachers watched in horror, Sentinelese tribesmen reached the two poachers and then hacked them to death with adzes. Which are like ice pick looking axes. A helicopter team from the Indian Coast Guard tried to land on the shore and recover the bodies days later, but they had to retreat because they were met by tribespeople who shot arrows and threw spears at them. But the blades of the helicopter's propeller were able to dust off enough sand on the shore to reveal a shallow grave containing the two bodies. Their bodies were then hung up on bamboo poles to look like scarecrows a few days later. Since the Indian government considers the Sentinelese sovereign people, they would not press charges against any of them. And of course, the thought of even trying to arrest any of these tribes' people was and is ridiculous, which is why none of the Sentinelese were arrested after our next topic, which is the most recent and famous hostile encounter with the tribe. Next, we'll be talking about the visits of John Allen Chow. What if I told you that you could get an even wider selection on Netflix. Well, with ExpressVPN, you can actually gain access to thousands of additional shows and movies by just changing your location with the help of ExpressVPN. Once you get ExpressVPN installed, it's super easy to use. It's literally two clicks or two taps of the button, and boom, you're connecting to Netflix from a different part of the world. Once you do that, all you have to do is refresh Netflix and then Netflix now thinks you're actually connecting or located in that region thanks to ExpressVPN, and you get access to, let's say, Canada's full library or Japan's full library. So as a result, you get so much more streaming content for the same price, which is awesome. 
ExpressVPN actually has over 100 different server locations, so you can gain access to thousands of new shows from all those different locations. And this works with other streaming services as well, including the BBC iPlayer, YouTube, and more. ExpressVPN is also crucial when using the internet on the road this holiday season. I don't know about you, but I'm gonna be traveling this holiday season, and every time I travel, I always make sure that I have ExpressVPN installed on my devices so that when I'm at the airport, I'm at the hotel or a cafe or something like that, when I'm using the public Wi-Fi, I'm able to stay secure thanks to ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN encrypts my internet traffic so that people can't hack or see what I'm doing on that public Wi-Fi. Plus, I love ExpressVPN because you can stream it in HD when connected to a VPN with zero buffering, which is not the case with all VPN services. Plus, it's compatible with all your devices, including your laptops, phones, media consoles, smart TVs, and more. And best of all, it encrypts your data and keeps you safe while browsing online. So be smart and stop paying full price for streaming services and only getting access to a fraction of their content. Get your money's worth at expressvpn.com slash milehire. And don't forget to use our link at expressvpn.com slash milehire to get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. So John Allen Chow was a 26-year-old American who attempted to visit the islands multiple times as a Christian missionary in 2018, and these visits ultimately ended in disaster. John Chow was born in Alabama, but he grew up in Vancouver, Washington, a city near Portland, Oregon. And John grew up with a love of the outdoors. Even from an early age, he developed a passion for hiking and exploring. But central to his life, was his love for God. John actually grew up in a Pentecostal Christian home and was very involved with the church from a young age. And after high school, he attended Oral Roberts University, which is a strict Pentecostal college. So John first heard about the North Sentinel Island in high school, and he was on a missionary website that documented isolated tribes who hadn't been converted to Christianity. The island is located on a so-called 1040 window or the resistant belt. And this is a region that contains countries with the least amount of practicing Christians and groups known as the unreached peoples. So it's kind of like a a challenge for the missionaries. So from then on, after John had heard about North Sentinel Island, it became his lifelong mission to convert the tribe. No easy task. He also wanted to try to convert other groups of people in this resistance belt. But unfortunately, he would never get the chance to even try. Over the years, John took many trips as a missionary, and he prepared for his North Sentinel trip for years. In 2017, he was accepted into an intense boot camp by Evangelical Christian Missionary Organization, All Nations. During this boot camp, All Nations definitely instilled a wartime mentality into John. He believed that spreading the gospel would be a dangerous battle that he needed to prepare for. And in one of the camp's exercises, missionaries trained John by pretending to be hostile natives armed with fake spears. He also got 13 vaccinations and planned a special quarantine period in preparation for the trip. However, the indigenous rights group Survival International said that this still would not have protected the tribe. Again, even a common cold could completely wipe them out. And that same year, John attended a program at the Canada Institute of Linguistics, which is a language school for missionaries. That's where he made a friend named Ben, and Ben was impressed with John's determination. Even though people tried to warn John against going, his mind was made up. In his diary, he asked God if the island was Satan's last stronghold, and he was determined to bring the gospel to the tribe. I can think of a lot more places more fitting of that title, yeah. Satan, Satan's Last Stronghold. <laughs> That's true. John knew that the mission would definitely put him and any missionary organization in jeopardy, but he described saving the Sentinelese people as his burden that only God could relieve him of. So in October of 2018, he set out for the Andaman Islands. He quarantined without sunlight for 11 days in preparation for his mission. And then on the night of November 14th, he paid some Christian fishermen to take him to the island. The ship carefully moved to avoid detection from the Coast Guard, of course, because this is illegal. Um, And John never informed the Indian government that he was going to be doing this. Then the ship approached the island 
and dropped an anchor nearby. They wouldn't go any further than that, and they were smart to do so. So John had to strip to his underwear and then head to the island the next morning. As he paddled up in his kayak, some Sentinelese tribespeople started to make high-pitched sounds. John shouted, My name is John. I love you. And Jesus loves you. And the tribespeople responded by drawing their arrows, of course, because obviously they have no idea what John is saying and probably wouldn't have given a damn about what he was saying, to be honest. But John panicked and threw some fish as a gift and then paddled away. Then he came back the next morning. And when John landed ashore, he stayed out of air range while the tribespeople started to shout at him. He also laid out some gifts and he tried to repeat back whatever the Sentinelese were saying, but they just burst out laughing at him. John said that the people viewed him with a mix of bewilderment, amusement, and hostility. And for a while, they sort of let him be. He sang worship songs and preached from the book of Genesis. I just don't know what he th- <laughs> how he thinks this is going to go. It's so off the wall. <sighs> but then one of the young boys finally had enough and he shot an arrow directly at John. And luckily for him, it hit his waterproof Bible, which he was clutching to his chest. And, you know, his Bible saved his life. After that, John pulled out the arrow and ran away. And the Sentinelese people stole his kayak, so he had to swim nearly a mile back to the fishing boat. But that's not going to stop him. He is not giving up here, people. John's diary entry that night was frustrated and sorrowful, He asked God why the little boy had to shoot him, and John regretted not snapping the arrow. He also wrote, Father, forgive him and any of the people on the island who try to kill me, and especially forgive them if they succeed. What made them become this defensive and hostile? Why does this beautiful place have so much death? Uh, Probably because of Maurice and what he did to them. Yep, yep. And probably others before him, honestly. Right. But even after all of this, John was still determined to convert the Sentinelese people to Christianity. And he came back the next day. After all, his passports were stolen in his kayak. So he would have been stuck for a while anyway. And even though he was starting to think maybe this wasn't a good idea, you know, he decided to pursue anyways. John was scared, but he had a plan. He was going to have the fishing boat leave and come back the next morning. That way, the people would be less intimidated if they didn't see the fishing boat. But John had another reason to send the fishermen away. He thought that if the tribe killed him, then the fishermen wouldn't have to see. So clearly, John was very aware of the risks and a great possibility that he would not make it out of this situation alive. But he decided to go forward anyway because he has his mission here. God told him to do it, so got to risk your life. He was scared. Obviously, he didn't want to die, but he believed that trying to spread the word of God was more important than his life. And in his mind, eternal salvation of the Sentinelese was worth the risk. He was basically willing to be a martyr for his faith, which is not not totally uncommon. I mean, it it sounds crazy to, to us and especially you guys, but like, from where I grew up, this is this is like what they teach you from a young, young age is like your mission to is to, yeah. I mean, ultimately, to be a martyr for Christ is like the highest honor, I guess, you could possibly achieve. But aren't there other lower hanging fruit here? Like, Well, I think that's what he realized is that, convert, you know? well, and, you know, I think part of it too is, you know, whether he ever would have admitted or not but obviously if he was successful in this mission which clearly not but if he had been i mean that would have been huge accolades for him mm. and, and especially in his missionary organization big win and he would have gone on to other tribes and you know continued it i mean i just look up the all nations website and their mission is literally all nations is a global family on a mission to see jesus worship by all the peoples of the earth that's the mission, which I think is a little, it's a little selfish if you ask me. Yeah, but, totally agree. Because, <laughs> you know, how do you know your, your faith is right? Yeah, I think it's very um, entitled. These, these guys have been living on this island for tens of thousands of mm-hmm. years. They seem to be doing just fine. Yeah. So what, what, is, what is 
bringing very, Christianity to them going to do for them? It's so disrespectful, honestly, to even, yeah. Other than destroying an entire indigenous culture. Mm-hmm. To put them at risk like that, too, knowing mm-hmm. that you could bring disease. I mean, whatever, with the isolation for a few days. Like, yeah. good job. That's not going to do shit. I mean, my thing is, like, I have no problem with missionaries or, you know, people who want to talk about their faith. I think that's fine. I think we're all entitled to, to talk about our faith. And I just think when you sort of corner people or you yeah. use other means, you know, oh, here's all these supplies. And yes. I, I mean, yeah. I'm speaking from personal experience. I went on a number of mission trips growing up and that was always my problem with it. I was always like, this is kind of like deceitful because we're doing all yeah. these nice things for these these people and they're they're very appreciative of it. But then we're like, okay, but, but to get it, you got to come to Bible study tonight and then we're going to, you know, yeah. try to save you tonight. Mm-hmm. So, and that that's where I was like, it's very like, Manipulative in mm-hmm. a way. In mm-hmm. a way, it is, mm-hmm. and 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 obviously, every church is different. Every approach is different, and I think some people do it right, where you go up and you ask somebody, like, "Hey, can I talk to you about yeah about Jesus or something?" And yeah. if they're like, "Sure, yeah," then that's fine. Like, I think if people want to engage in conversation about about Christianity, that's fine. I just think when you're sort of taking this forceful method because you're on some type of like mission you know that this battle ready mission Mm -hmm. that's kind of where i draw the line i'm like "Eh." and obviously this applies to all a lot of yeah yeah not yeah obviously not not Mm -hmm. not just christianity but yeah yeah it's one thing to you know do it to people who are willing to hear but to unsolicited like you know especially to go it'd be like if we went to the native american reservation and we're like hey we're here to tell you about you know this new religion that we've come up with and you need to you need to accept this because your life is doomed otherwise you're you're going to end up in hell you're going to be when you die you're going to go vi- like it's just there's something so fundamentally wrong with that i feel mm-hmm. like i agree especially with what john was doing going to a group that clearly doesn't even want to speak to you and then trying to convert them honestly it's just it's just stupid like mm-hmm. he really thought this was going to work in any way like i can't imagine getting my mind to a place where i thought i'd be able to do this well it makes it seem like i don't think he really cared whether or not it was gonna turn out well for him like i think he was really yeah. willing to die for it he knew that, that was a chance that that could happen and i think he believed so strongly that he yeah. was doing the right thing whether that belief you know really originated from him or from his missionary group yeah you know, that's kind of up for debate like maybe they kind of lack for lack of a better term brainwashed him into believing that he had to go and do all these things yeah it could be yeah common sense goes out the window yeah i mean i think he was kind of brainwashed to be honest Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. into thinking that like he was the one that needed to what are you the chosen one to go out to these people Mm -hmm. and try and convert them definitely what he and then when you go and they shoot an arrow at you and clearly make it known that they don't want you here you go back yeah like you're almost well, I don't know. I don't want to say you're asking for no, it, but you're asking for it. I completely agree. Yeah. Definitely asking for it. Um, and, I mean, yeah, it's definitely clear that he knew he could die and that he probably would. But what's weird to me is that he thought he'd even have a chance to convert this whole tribe. Right. He really thought that was going to happen. It's bizarre. Well, you it's, got you got to remember too here. Okay, I know from like a logical perspective. Yeah. It doesn't make sense, but you have to think from his mindset and his mindset is that the Lord is behind him. Mm. So when you truly believe that you have the power of the Holy Spirit, I see what you're saying, the Holy Ghost, you've got Jesus right behind you. Like he thought he'd be able to convince all these people. Yeah. Well, I think he thought that he'd have some help from the Lord God. Mm. Or if he goes there. And it gets killed, then it's like, well, that was God's will. Now I'm going to meet right. God. Well, like, that's, that's I did the, the ultimate sacrifice, part. and God, maybe, I don't know, I can't speak for him, but I could see him thinking, like, in a way, he's rewarding me for doing this yeah. by letting me meet God. Like, he's taking me home now. It's literally in the Bible. Wow. Like, if you're a martyr for God, like... Mm. You're the ultimate hero? You're, you're, yeah, you're getting, a, you're getting a real nice place in heaven, that's for sure. Getting the penthouse suite, that's for sure. <laughs> God. behind the pearly gates no i'm dead serious i know it's it, we're like thinking this great but this is what what they believe i mean it's just faith is a powerful thing and both for good and bad and mm-hmm. i think this is just an example of where it goes bad because mm-hmm. you start believing that you've got divine you, that know, you know a divine power behind you and 
but you know that it's his choice it's his choice at the end yeah. of the day he chose this and you know he felt like this was his mission and well let's he gave it his best shot let's find out what happened to john here okay so in his last diary entry john wrote you guys might think i'm crazy in all this but i think it's worth it to declare jesus to these people please do not get angry at them or at god if i get killed so that afternoon, the fishermen left, and John paddled out to shore alone. And the fishermen came back to the island the next day, and on shore, they saw the tribesmen dragging John's body by a rope. He was dead, and it's not known exactly how he died, but he was likely killed by arrows. The Indian police decided that it would be too dangerous to try and recover John's body, and he's likely been buried somewhere on the island. After John's death, all nations described him as a martyr who died in service to God. John's father blamed the group for his son's death, and he says that the organization pushed John into their extreme version of Christianity and sent him off into a very dangerous situation. And of course, many people on social media, including Christians, sounded off against the missionary group that trained John. His death caused a lot of backlash and criticism against missionary organizations that try to convert indigenous peoples who clearly want to be left alone. The United States announced that they wouldn't be seeking any charges against the Sentinelese people for this. The Indian government basically announced the same thing. And of course, John's visit was far from the first clash between Christian missionaries and uncontacted tribes. So we all know the holidays are coming up quick, and they're the happiest season, right? Well, let's be real. Between the hectic holiday travel and stressing over getting that family recipe just right, the last thing you want to worry about is finding a great gift for everyone on your list. So in the spirit of giving, why not gift premium audio products from Raycon? Raycon's wireless earbuds, headphones, and speakers offer premium sound, useful features, an almost custom, comfortable fit, and up to 54 hours of battery life. Anyone you gift them to will find use for them right away, whether they use the speakers to start a party in the living room or escape the party completely and use the earbuds to find some much-needed zen meditation. And as the person gifting them, you gotta love that they start at half the price of other premium audio brands. You guys know we love Raycons. They're comfortable, they sound great, and you really cannot beat the price. Plus, I love how many color options they come in. Raycon makes this stressful holiday period easy with holiday gift guides for everyone in your life. And for the next month, Raycon will have a countdown to Christmas with a new pop-up flash deal that you can take advantage of every single day. And now you can find Raycon in stores at Kohl's or Walmart. But let me tell you right now, you're always going to get the best deal at buyraycon.com slash milehire. The Raycon website also offers free shipping, free returns, buy now and pay later options, plus a 30-day happiness guarantee. And from 1213 to 1220, you can get free express shipping on orders over 85 when you use the code HOLIDAY. So right now, go to buyraycon.com slash milehire to get 15% off site-wide with code HOLIDAY, plus free shipping. That's code HOLIDAY at buyraycon.com slash milehire for 15% off your Raycon purchase. Again, buyraycon.com slash mile higher. So the next uncontacted tribe that we will be talking about is the Tagaeri, and they are a subgroup of the Huarani people of Ecuador. And they have had their fair share of clashes with both missionaries and agribusiness operations. Just wanted to say that we're doing our best with these indigenous names to try to pronounce them correctly. Yeah. So forgive us if we get them wrong from time to time. It's very difficult to repeat them over and over again. The Harani are a group of indigenous people who live deep in the Amazonian jungles of Ecuador. There are multiple different tribes or subgroups of the Harani tribe. Some subgroups have made contact with the outside world, but others have remained uncontacted and choose to live in voluntary isolation. Many Harani groups live in permanent forest settlements, and over the past few decades they've been pushed out of their lands and been forced to make contact after invasions from U.S. and European oil companies. These oil companies have destroyed their lands, introduced diseases, and changed their way of life. So naturally, many Horani groups have resisted colonization. They refuse to connect with the outside world to preserve their safety and their way of life as they should. Before their first contact, the Horani people were known to other tribes as fierce warriors who were highly protective of their land. After many Horani people were first contacted, they made their peace with modern Ecuador. But multiple Horani families resisted and broke off from the group, and they formed their own tribe known as the Tagaeri. 
The Tagieri are also known as the red feet for the use of the achiote, a red plant used for body paint. They outright rejected modernization, and they continued to practice their way of life in the jungle, including hunting, fishing, and farming the root vegetable, yucca. In the mid-1950s, the Harani people were invaded by Christian missionaries who wanted to convert them. The Taga Eri first started their war against colonization in 1968 when they killed five U.S. missionaries. But as the years went on, oil, palm, and lumber operations in the area continued to threaten their land. So the Taga Eri continued to defend their home and use deadly force when necessary. Dozens of workers for these companies were killed by the Taga Eri after they encroached on their lands. In August of 1987, a Catholic nun and a bishop went to visit the Taga Eri. The two missionaries were 50-year-old sister Ines Arango and 67-year-old Bishop Alejandro Labaca. The bishop had been concerned about the tribe's attacks on lumber and oil workers. He was actually under contract from Ecuador State Petroleum Corporation. The bishop and the nun's mission was to spread the word of God to the tribe. They were not successful, as you can probably imagine. The bishop went on eight helicopter flights over the territory to spot the Taga Eri and make contact with them. In one visit, he dropped down sterilized gifts to their village, including machetes, cooking pots, and salt packages. Two of the Taga Eri made gestures that the bishop interpreted as friendly, and that in his mind was the go-ahead that he should visit and try to convert them. So after loading up some food rations and Bibles into a helicopter, he and Sister Arango flew to the Taga Eri village. They told the pilot to come back in two days, and they shimmy down a rope into Taga Eri land. Can you imagine? Brave. Just dropping down like that. Very brave. Yeah, very brave. Didn't go well. Two days later, the pilot came back and found both of them dead. The nun and bishop had been brutally sacrificed by the tribe. Their bodies were found pinned to the ground with 21 heavy wooden spears. Their bodies also had 109 other spear wounds. And some of those wounds were stuffed with leaves to stop blood flow and prolong their suffering. The uh. tribesmen also put up a pole with a bone tied to the top next to the bodies. And this was a warning from the tribe that any other invaders would meet a similar fate to the missionaries. The bishop had previously ignored multiple warning signs to stay away. For one, he misinterpreted some of the gestures two of the Taga Eri made when he dropped down the gifts. He thought that there were smiles and friendly gestures, but this might not have been the case. Second, flying in on a giant helicopter would have definitely been intimidating to the Taga Eri. And lastly, he apparently didn't notice that a red stripe had been painted on top of one of the Taga Eri straw huts, and this stripe was a declaration of war against any outside intruders. And the tribe has kept their word. In 2002, three loggers who were encroaching on Taga Eri lands were attacked by members of the tribe. The loggers responded by fatally shooting one of the tribesmen. A few days later, the tribe got their revenge for their fallen tribesmen by killing three loggers with traditional javelins. From 2005 to 2008, the tribe caught three poachers who were illegally harvesting rare wood on Taga Eri land, and they were all found speared to death. In 2008, there were not only attacks on the Taga Eri, but also the Taromainane. The Taromainane are another on-contact group living in Ecuador, and actually the word Taromainane translates to people of the road. And the Taga Eri and Taromainane make up the last two known indigenous groups living in voluntary isolation in Ecuador. And even though the Taga Eri and the Taromanane are the only two self-isolation groups recognized by the Ecuadorian state, there is evidence that other uncontacted groups still live in isolated areas around the country. Loggers actually killed and beheaded five tribesmen who are trying to get them off of their protected land. And unfortunately, the government hasn't done a lot to address these killings and the continued encroachment on the tribe's protected land. Massacres and violence against these tribes have wiped out dozens of tribespeople. Their numbers have dwindled to the point where their population is estimated to be less than 100 people. A lawyer on behalf of the tribes in voluntary isolation has brought a lawsuit against the Ecuadorian government for failing to protect the tribe's human rights. It's the first ever regional court case involving the rights of indigenous peoples in voluntary isolation, and the case is being heard by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. The verdict in this case could potentially stop oil drilling on protected land and the Asuni National Park. But the next tribe we're going to be talking about is the Kawahiva, a group of nomadic indigenous people who live in isolation in the Brazilian state of Mato Grosso. The Kawahiva tribe are hunter-gatherers of the Rio Pardo area, which is on the border of the states Mato Grosso and Amazonas. Since they are a nomadic group who move around a dense, isolated area of the Amazon jungle, they have little to no contact from the outside world. 
and they do not trust outsiders that they do come across. In fact, there have been no peaceful encounters between the Kawahiva and the outside world. They're so isolated that very little is actually known about their tribe. We do know that they share some similarities with the neighboring tribe, Piripi Kura. Both tribes' people cut their hair the same way, speak similar languages, and use the same kind of arrowheads for fishing. And there are actually only two remaining survivors of the Piripi Kura tribe. The rest of their tribe has actually been killed. And these two survivors worry that they will also be murdered by farmers and ranchers. In the past, the Kawahiva probably lived a less nomadic lifestyle, cultivating corn and yucca. But as their land and resources have been stolen over the years, they have since been forced to move around in an increasingly shrinking territory. The Kawahiva were once part of a larger indigenous group. But like the Tagaeri in Ecuador, they had to split off from this group after outsiders invaded, and many of their tribespeople were likely murdered or died of outside diseases during these invasions. Now, the Mato Grosso region, which they live in, is one of the most violent in Brazil due to land-related conflicts. Gangs of farmers have murdered indigenous activists over land disputes. In 2016 alone, 61 indigenous land rights campaigners in Brazil were murdered. And Colniza, which is the closest city to the Kawahiva, makes 90% of their income illegally logging in the area. In 2001, FUNAI, or the National Indian Foundation, got the Brazilian government to grant legal protection for 410,000 acres of land known as the Rio Pardo Indigenous Area. Outsiders were forbidden from entering this area, but of course, loggers continued to cut down trees on the land anyway. In 2005, loggers were able to convince a judge to overturn the order but indigenous rights groups successfully campaigned to have the order reinstated. Still, loggers and farmers have continued to violate the order. They've even accused Funai of implanting the Kawahiva to protect the land, meaning they're denying the tribe actually exists. The loggers have even threatened Funai and blocked them from protecting the tribe. The loggers also fly planes low over their camps to intimidate and scare them. They've also built logging trails incredibly close to these camps, which possess a potential disease threat. The Kawahiva population is now dwindling due to encroachment by loggers, miners, ranchers, and land speculators. Invasions and illegal logging operations may have killed many Kawahiva people over the past few decades through murder and spreading of disease. There are only an estimated 30 of them left. And because of this, the tribe is constantly on the run. They only stay in one spot for a few days before they relocate. We learn a lot of what we know about the tribe from studying dwellings that they leave behind. The Kawahiva live by hunting game like monkeys, birds, fish, and peccaries, which are wild pig-like mammals, sort of like javelinas. They also collect nuts, berries, and honey. And in one abandoned settlement, researchers found the Kawahiva had buried mounds of Brazilian nuts. They also build intricate ladders to collect honey from bees' nests and use traps to catch fish. And they also surround their camps with fences made out of palm branches. This could be to keep intruders or wild animals out. Based on cages and feathers found at the camps, the Kawahiva may keep parakeets as pets, which is pretty interesting. Funai is responsible for keeping the tribe protected. They have been monitoring the tribe for over 17 years without making direct contact. In 2013, a Funai employee spotted a group of Kawahiva tribe members by chance. They were making their way from one village to the next. The field worker hid and recorded the tribe as they walked. When one of the women actually spotted him, she yelled, enemy, and then the whole tribe fled. So here's the first recorded footage of the tribe. My thoughts going through your head when you're being filmed by a camera. No, oh, I know. Like, what do you even right. make of it all? Yeah. Really wild. Oh, 
So in 2016, after pressure from indigenous rights groups, Brazil's justice minister signed the tribe's protective order into law. Sadly, the order has not been well enforced. Invasions of local loggers continue to threaten the Kawahiva's existence. And as waves of loggers continue to circle in on the land, the Kawahiva have become trapped and they are running out of places to flee. Due to severe budget cuts, Funai has lacked resources to effectively patrol and protect the area. They're still fighting to remove the armed gangs of illegal loggers to this day. And if the loggers win, the Kawahiva tribe could be wiped out. The genocide of the tribe will be complete at that point. And sadly, the Kawahiva wouldn't be the last tribe in Brazil lost due to genocide. We actually don't know the name of the next tribe that we'll be talking about. In fact, we don't know much about the tribe at all. And that's because when the tribe was officially discovered, it only had one living member, a tribesman nicknamed the Man of the Hole and the world's loneliest man. If you've never heard of Masterclass before, then you have been missing out. I'm a huge fan of Masterclass because I think what makes it so unique and cool is the fact that you can actually learn about different topics in all sorts of different categories like food, design and style, art and entertainment, music, business, writing, home and lifestyle wellness. They have basically all the major interest groups all on their website. What's cool is that the actual master classes are taught by some of the most well-known people in those different fields. For example, I'm really into the space exploration masterclass, which is taught by Chris Hadfield, who is an astronaut, which is really cool. There's also another masterclass I'm a big fan of hosted by John Douglas, and he teaches you how to think like an FBI profiler. I think you can gain so much knowledge when you actually learn from the people who have done it and the people who have made a name for themselves in that particular field or skill set. And I think that's what makes Masterclass truly unique. I can't tell you how many Masterclasses I've watched on cooking from Gordon Ramsay, big fan of his, and I've learned so much from him as opposed to going out and trying to learn on my own, learn from the best. That's what Masterclass offers. What's great is that you can learn from the world's best artists, icons, and leaders anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. They have over 180 classes from a range of world-class instructors, so they've got something for everyone. A Masterclass membership also makes for a great gift this holiday season, so I highly recommend you check it out. This holiday, give the perfect gift of an annual Masterclass membership and get one free. It's a BOGO deal. Go to masterclass.com slash milehire today. That's masterclass.com slash milehire. Terms apply. So the man of the whole was a sole inhabitant of the Tanaru indigenous territory. This territory is in the western Brazilian state. Of Hodonia. It is unknown what the name of his people was, what language they spoke, or many of their customs. Most of his tribe was wiped out by a genocide committed by cattle ranchers in the 80s and 90s. His subgroup was part of a tribe that was known outsiders as the Flecheros, or People of the Arrow. By 1995, there were only seven tribe members left, including the man. That year, six of the members were murdered by illegal miners, making the man in the hole the last survivor. After his entire tribe was killed, the man had no choice but to live in isolation for the rest of his life. For 26 years, he lived a solitary existence, and as far as we know, nobody from the outside world has ever successfully contacted him. God, that's like That's a just long sad. time by yourself. That's so sad. He was discovered by Funai in 1996 when they found out about the atrocity committed against the people of the Arrow. When the organization investigated, they found that the tribe's village had been bulldozed. They also discovered the man was the genocide's lone survivor, and they've been monitoring him ever since. Over the next few years, they had a few close encounters, but they were always very tense. During one encounter, a Funai worker got too close and the man shot him in the chest with a bow and arrow. The Funai worker survived. After that, Funai adopted a no-contact policy with the man, and they tried to protect him from a distance without being noticed. He moved around frequently and built small huts as shelters, and he became known as the man of the hole because he left behind a narrow hole over six feet deep in the center of all of his former living spaces. Well, there's no sound in this video clip, actually. But yeah, you can see that looks like some type of like pipe could have been used to gather water or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's then, amazing that we just basically have to guess what all of these things were used yeah, for. Yeah. Now that you know they're not living there anymore, it's a pretty nice hut. 
Yeah, it's amazing what they're able to Very build. Very good. Imagine wow. living in that. It's hard to even imagine, really. I know. Some tools. It's just crazy to think, you know, here we are on the other side of things, so mm -hmm. close to being one with robots, and then there are beings that live like this. Mm -hmm. It's just so vastly different on the same planet. It's like hard to wrap your mind around. It's amazing what they can build with their hands. Yeah. I couldn't even build a paper airplane. Agreed. So it's been speculated that the man used the holes as hiding places or they had some spiritual significance to him. The man had built over 50 huts with deep holes in them during his life. When Funai searched the destroyed village in 1996, they found 14 holes similar to the man's. The man had also dug pitfall holes to trap wildlife like wild hogs, and some holes had sharp stakes in them. The man hunted wild game, cultivated corn and yucca, and collected honey, papayas, and bananas for food. The man also left markings on trees that field workers believe have spiritual significance. And since the man lived such an isolated existence, spirituality probably played a big role in his life. Over the years, Funai officials kept their distance, but sometimes they'd leave gifts like seeds and tools. The man fled from many Funai officials he saw, and these officials would monitor the perimeter of his reserve to protect the man from poachers and farmers. Although the man did not want contact with outsiders, he seemed to have some sort of trust built with the Funai field workers. He sometimes left behind signals to warn them of pitfalls he had dug to trap animals. In 2007, documentary filmmakers captured video outside of the man's house. From inside the house, the man looked scared and he pointed arrows at the crew who were strangers to him. The filmmakers did leave behind some axes as gifts. Here's a recording of their interaction. He's always got his bow out. Yeah. That's amazing. He built that. Later on in 2009, there were some armed gunmen who attempted to murder the man of the hole. Luckily, he survived the attack. And the ranchers were angry that the protection order for the man's land was renewed. This order was preventing them from using the land for farming use. After the attack, Funai officials returned to their nearby protection post and found out that it had been attacked as well. There were empty bullet casings near it and the post had been ransacked. The perpetrators were never caught, but Funai believed that this was a threat from the ranchers to stop protecting the man. In 2018, a Funai official captured video of the man chopping down a tree in the jungle, and it's one of the very few glimpses the outside world has caught of his life. Let's take a look at that video. If you're listening, this man is trying to chop down a tree. Mm -hmm. That repetitive sound. Yeah. Well built act, though. Yeah. It's amazing how much work goes in and time goes into, you know, one somewhat simple task of cutting down a tree. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's not simple, but you get what I mean. Yeah. Nowadays, we mm -hmm. just take a sob, zoom, done. Yep. Yep. 10 seconds. No, it's so true. But they have so much more appreciation for yeah. everything, you know? Absolutely. So much work goes into everything they do. Mm -hmm. Well, what else are they going to do? Yeah. It's not like they have a job to go commute to. Mm -mm. They just got to. I mean, and they alive. likely don't know about the alternative things that we have, sure. you know, so it's not like they dwell on that too much, but. So this man, every time he moves, he has to clear an area of trees like you just saw him doing before, he, you know, he can build his hut. But every time he, you know, somebody encroaches on his, his camp, he moves, you know, out of fear of what, what could happen. And so that's pretty much like probably a weekly thing, I would imagine, or maybe a monthly mm -hmm. thing that he goes and has days, to basically rebuild his whole camp. I mean 
pretty badass, honestly, that he's able to do that. All those trees again. But most recently in August of 2022, the man of the hole was sadly found dead in a hammock at his home. He passed away sometime in July of this year and he was around 60 years old, but it looks like he died from natural causes. That is so impressive. The man's body was also covered in macaw feathers, which might indicate that the man knew he was about to die. Mm. But the man of the hole has become a symbol of the atrocities committed against indigenous peoples, but he's also a symbol of resilience and resistance. The survival of uncontacted tribes is under extreme threat by greed and corruption. And if these tribes aren't protected, they can be wiped out just like the man of the hole and his tribe. Brazil's president, Jair Bolsonaro, has severely gutted Funai and stripped them of their power. He's also put people who are friendly towards agribusiness interests in key positions at Funai, which poses a huge threat to indigenous peoples in isolation. So sad. Other tribes and places all around the world face similar threats from things like illegal logging, oil and gas companies, deforestation, and other forms of land trafficking. They've also been continually threatened by missionaries who want to convert them. Mm, This is the cherry on top there. It's important to note that these tribes have built a relationship with the earth and God in their own rich, sacred cosmology over a millennia. And yet Christian missionaries still think that they know better than people who have such a symbiotic land relationship. Which is why bringing education and awareness to the existence of uncontacted tribes will help protect their right to self-determination and isolation and standing up for the rights of indigenous people all over the world, as well as the protection of their land for generations to come. Absolutely crucial. If you're spending time with your loved ones this holiday season, chances are you're going to hear a lot of stories. And some of them may be stories you've already heard before. But if you ever wanted to help your loved ones document those timeless stories, it can be challenging to write an entire book of life memories. But with StoryWorth, it makes it fun and easy. This is how anyone can write a book about their life. Every week, StoryWorth will email your loved ones with a single life-related question that you pick from their collection, like, what's the bravest thing you've ever done? What's the farthest you've traveled? And all they have to do is reply with a story. Then after a year, StoryWorth compiles your loved one's stories, memories, and even any photos that are included into an exquisite hardcover book, creating a valued keepsake. I'm going to be gifting StoryWorth to my dad this year, and I am so excited about it. There are just endless amounts of stories that my dad has told me over the years that I just want to have documented and be able to save it for me and my children and their children. It's just so cool how it can be cherished for generations. Millions of stories have already been told with StoryWorth because they make the process so simple. So get started with your loved one for the holidays. And before you know it, you'll both be cherishing those timeless stories for generations to come. Help your family share their story this holiday season with StoryWorth. Go to storyworth.com slash milehire today and save $10 on your first purchase. That's S-T-O-R-Y-W-O-R. TH.com slash mile hire to save $10 on your first purchase. Storyworth.com slash mile hire. I'm curious what you guys think about the whole idea of us, you know, going out and trying to learn and educate ourselves on these, you know, different groups of people. Because on one hand, I think without doing that, then we're less likely to try and work towards conservation and protecting these people and protecting their land if we don't go out and educate Mm -hmm. ourselves on the fact that they are there but on the other hand obviously they don't want to be contacted they don't want to be bothered so we're doing them a disservice but i was just kind of curious what your thoughts are like do you think Mm -hmm. that we should completely have no contact with them and no attempt to try and educate ourselves to in return hopefully try and you know help save them in a way and also the fact that it's extremely interesting for us to learn about, but that's just more like a selfish, yeah, you know. Right. But I'm right. talking about more so to try and protect them. And yeah. if we know that they're out there and they and we know that they're living off this land, you know, then we can try and conserve their land, which also, you know, is the bigger picture of global warming and not, you know, mm-hmm. de- deforestation, mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. So what's your opinion? Like, do you think we should continue doing what we're doing or do you think that we should just completely back off and let them be on their own. You know, I definitely see what you're saying. And I think that having education about what they're doing to some degree does help us protect them better. Well, that's what you would hope for. Yeah. That's not always that's the case. What are we doing to protect them? Well, some some governments are, but I mean, with the Sentinel uh, lease, they're protected to some degree. Mm-hmm. But yeah, well, they're it just also depends on an on... island, though. It's easier to protect an island than it is, you know, the Yeah, that's the true. That's true. 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't really know what the right answer is or if I have a strong opinion either way, because I do think that respecting what they want is very important. But we also know there's all these dangers out there that they don't even know right. all of them that exist, like all the potential threats to them in the world. And so, you know, on that hand, you kind of think we got to at least know something about them in order to protect them. But I mean, at the same time, you could know very little and still offer some basic protections. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. It's a difficult question. That's that's a good question. What do you think? I think here's what the reality is. The reality is that most of these tribes, especially ones that are landlocked or, you know, in areas where civilization is quite near, if there is, if there's no no knowledge of them, could they stay hidden? Sure, maybe, but they're not gonna. the 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 amount of illegal logging that's happening, and, yeah. You know these corporations like are ruthless, man. They'll just mm -hmm. kill. They'll just kill and annihilate everything in their path. Yeah. And if there's nothing there to stop them, then everybody's wiped out. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a benefit to knowing that they exist. I just think that it, we have modern technology, and I'm sure there's ways to be more discreet and covert about how we go about identifying them and watching them versus like actually sending humans into the jungle. You know, mm -hmm. like you know, mm -hmm. you can see them from the air, or other other ways or you know, shit, drones are so small now. You could fly a drone through the forest and, yeah. you know, monitor them that way or place cameras in different areas. To just capture to say, like, enough information. Keep watch over them. Need. Keep watch over them because they don't understand the, day, you know, the threats yeah. that, that exist in this day and age. Eyes on, hands off. Like exactly. An earlier. eyes on, hands off approach because otherwise mm -hmm. they're, they're just going to get wiped out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the indigenous people are going to get wiped out because greed Yep. And money trumps everything. And, so fucking sad. And that's just the reality of the world. And if nobody's there to protect them, they're not going to have the ability to protect themselves from what's to come. So I'd say there absolutely needs to be protections and laws and, and consequences for those that break them. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, psh, if there was no rules or laws protecting them. They're all gone. They're all going to be gone. Because yeah, that's just the, the way that things are trending when it comes to, mm -hmm. you know, oil gas companies and logging yeah, ruthless just, what um, do you think i'm curious well i don't know because part of me thinks you know at the beginning we were talking about how a lot of these governments deny the fact that they're even there and in order to try and be like they're not there what are you talking about so we can just take yeah. all of their land and do whatever we want and so yeah. i think the only way to really stop that or to prove that they are there is by mm -hmm. going in and getting proof yep so i think you know to some degree we need to keep uh, an eye on them, I guess you could say. And like Josh was saying, you know, does that mean going in there and trying to spread the gospel? No, of no. course not. But I think, yeah, there's more discreet ways. Mm -hmm. It is hard because a lot of them are in the forest. And if you're flying over them, it just, you can't see it. Like there's trees everywhere. It's not like yeah, you, you can be like, oh, there, there yeah, they are. Right. They're still there. So you kind of have to that's a good be point. more intrusive than just like the flying a drone over or like a plane or something because it's so dense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I think it's really hard because obviously they want to be, res you know, we, I want to respect them. I think most people want to respect their wish to be left alone. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, in a perfect world, that would be great. But unfortunately there's a lot of people with bad plans to mm -hmm. hurt these people or hurt their land. And in order to try and protect them, we have to, you know, keep proving that they are there mm -hmm. there's this one picture i found was really interesting and it's basically this territory that the man in the hole like lived in and the orange lines here are the border of the territory and so you can see in his territory how lush and green and beautiful it is versus on the so outskirts thick, yeah and so it makes me feel like it's so important to respect these territories not only for the people but for our mm -hmm. land, land and for deforestation yep you know what i mean like that's proof right there that that is a you know part where you can't you can't go in there and you can't yeah. fuck with that area and look at how thriving it is and how wow. luscious it is yeah seeing that from afar is pretty wild i feel like there's going to be ways to do this more efficiently here in the future which is this is where tech, modern technology could potentially assist in this problem is allowing us to keep an eye and you know i mean god we were just talking about invisibility 
the other week and how mm-hmm. there's invisibility cloaks, you know, and, and there's the, this type of camouflage technology now. You know, I think I think maybe there needs to be some sort of global group that's formed that their their number one task is, you know, much like there's these special rangers that protect endangered wildlife from poachers. Maybe you have a similar type of almost like a law enforcement post that actually their sole job is to basically kind of be in these camouflage outposts throughout these regions, and you know they keep an eye, they keep an eye on the indigenous peoples from from afar and just yeah. prevent. Well, and not just the people, people, but the land. Yeah, in the land, well, the just land the land, well. the There's forest so as well. That. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. And the wildlife. I mean, yeah, it would be cool if we had more discreet but, ways of keeping track of more of these areas in it, a more I vast just, capacity. It's, yeah, it's it's hard to be optimistic about it though because just the way that the I mean the governments don't view it that way. They view it as, you know, there's there's profits to be made and you yeah. know, trees will grow back. So, you know. Mm-hmm. It's not not a huge issue for them because yeah. ultimately the amount of, you know, the amount of money and resources they're going to gain from bulldozing these these areas is outweighs the cost of the humans that live there, as we've seen over and over again throughout history, it's profits over people every time. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a difficult battle, and you know I guess there's activist groups out there trying to trying to raise awareness and mm-hmm. and raise money and and get signatures and things like that. And I think that's great, but I just I don't know that there's much any of us can do unfortunately it feels that way yeah it does but it there, feels really helpless there are some small ways that you can help survival international like we shortly mentioned before is a group that is dedicated to help protect uncontacted tribes and the land they live on their website says we are a movement of people from over 100 countries our vision is a world where tribal peoples are respected as contemporary societies and their human rights are protected we reject government funding so we can guarantee our absolute independence and integrity. We rely on you. We work in partnership with tribal peoples to campaign, lobby, and protest for their land rights. We investigate, expose, and confront atrocities committed by governments and big business. We are here to amplify the tribal voice and make sure it is heard. Survival International has created a petition that you can sign titled The Global Declaration for Uncontacted Tribes. The petition says, join the global call for governments to protect uncontacted tribes' land and prevent forced contact. Only when tribal people's rights are respected can they survive and determine their own futures. They are trying to get to 100,000 signatures, and they only have a little over 35,000. So please, guys, take the time to go and sign that petition. We'll have it linked below and in our show notes. And they also do have a donation page as well. So if you're feeling generous... Um, maybe consider donating to them as well. It's a really great cause. But yeah, it's a very serious issue that I don't think a lot of people even fully understand. I mean, I think the average diff- person yeah. doesn't isn't really completely aware of these uncontacted groups. It's tough because it's like this issue stems from a larger issue. It stems from an even larger issue. And when you work your way all the way up to the top, it's like, what do we do? What can be done? It's yeah. like the world's not going to just all of a sudden stop needing timber. So the the forests are going to keep getting plowed and you know it's like what what's what's going to change? It's just sometimes I'm just like, "Oh, man. I I think at the very very core of everything, I think that the the fact that we took land from indigenous peoples in the first place is just I know. It's just completely messed up. And I mean, you, when you talk about that, you're going back, you know, thousands of years and yeah. it's just, it's such a complex issue that it's, it's hard to see a, there being a, a simple solution for no, it. No, there's but, definitely not. Yeah. But I think at the very least having awareness mm-hmm. about these things is good. Yeah. And maybe you're somebody out there who had no idea that there is uncontacted peoples out there. And mm-hmm. I think at least knowing about it so that. You know, if it ever comes along that you can help in some way that you at least are armed with the knowledge. Mm-hmm. Uh, or can share that knowledge with the, other people. Yeah, the reality of what's going on. Yeah, because like we said, education about these tribes is definitely crucial to their survival. And for the love of God, literally, can these missionaries stop 
trying to convert uh, the indigenous so people. It's like and bizarre. Come on now. Yeah. They've got their they've had their own religious beliefs, spiritual beliefs for mm-hmm. longer than the Bible's probably even been around. So it's just yeah. It's interesting to think about how, you know, we look at these groups and we think how different it would be to live without all of our modern luxuries, all the things we have, and to live without any of that seems so shocking and and you'd think like, oh, I could never do that. I can imagine that, but they don't know any different. And so they it's quite possible that they would never want to I'm, I'm sure they wouldn't want to live any other way and that they would never want to live the way that we do with all of the you know horrible things that we have in our societies and things that we deal with and i don't know it's just it's very interesting to think if they could trade places with us would they even want to do they have any interest in us like i'm just well, I, I think the thing i would it, love to know the mind of these people you i know? think it's what? hard to say because i think if you introduced anybody I mean, you you know, we've all seen the shows on TLC where they take the Amish people and they bring them into modern society and all of a sudden they're like, oh, this is great. Yeah. Well, you they know, choose for, to, to clarify. Yeah. Don't just take them and bring them in. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm but just. yeah, I know what you're this is, this is This is what I think is that if you are presented with the opportunity to eliminate discomfort, pain, being cold, hungry, a lot of these just basic things that we need in order to survive as a human being, you take those, you know, you, you take care of that for somebody. I think no matter who you are, that you're going to, you're going to sort, you're going to fall for that. You're going to accept really? that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I absolutely think that over time people are going to do that. If you give them, if you show them and they, they start experiencing these things, there might be one or two people that say no, but I think the majority of people are going to enjoy that. I mean, versus the other way around. You think that these, if you went, went to, well, obviously we know what would happen if you went up to a tribe and tried to explain this to them, but if they really understood the choice between how they're living and how we're living, you think they would choose to come live like us? I think they would adopt a lot of the things that we have. I mean, if you just look at the fact that they're, they're, using debris metals and iron and things like that are washed up on shore and they're they're realizing like oh this material is going to improve this aspect of my life mm-hmm. so if you continue to present them like different, over a long period of time they wouldn't just drop everything obviously and no that's what i'm saying is that obviously there's the the part of they've lived this way for so long so obviously you can't shock them too much so you wouldn't want to drop them in the middle of new york city but what i'm saying is that if you introduce them to things slowly mm-hmm. over time that or at any point and they start realizing what you're dropping are going to help better their lives. Are they going to reject those things? Well, maybe like tools and stuff, but I'm like talking creature I'm, comforts. I'm ta- okay. Well, I'm talking about like technology, heat, cooling. I'm talking mm-hmm. about, uh, but what about like phones, and- refrigeration, things like things that improve the quality of your life. I'm not talking about phones is not a necessity. I'm talking about necessity technologies that are a necessity to our daily lives a toothbrush that help keep our teeth clean things like mm-hmm. that i'm yeah, not talking well, about that cell wasn't my phones question and, my and question was would games. they want to come live in our society Eventually, over theirs you think they would i think they probably think what we have going on like that there's a lot of evil behind some of the luxuries that we have yeah and yeah scary and- well yeah they there would be that but i think they would still take you know they would they might take some of that with them back to their island and use it and and continue do living you know their their path their culture but then a, just using some of these these technologies that have come along as well i think i think i mean that's how we all got here in the first place right was from being introduced to these technologies over time the wheel fought mm-hmm, you know fire mm-hmm. all the, you know being able to make tools stone metal all these things you look at history it's all been this slow drip advancement of yeah. of technologies and so i think we're all human we're all human being we all have human nature we all I, I think we all experience the same emotions and whether you you grow up in the amazon rainforest or you grow up in uh you know a different part of the world or different culture i think we all have at the very root of who we are the same needs and wants and which is why if you look like around on a basic, if you, basic on the level, yeah. i'm talking on a very basic level if you look at the way the world is now 
different countries are at different levels of advancement. But all the same technologies are making their way into all the remote places of the world. And new technologies are coming along, like Starlink, which is going to allow people to get internet literally anywhere on the planet, including Antarctica. So that technology starts getting dispersed to other parts. You know, it's going to catch everybody up and people are going to, I think everybody and humans just in nature want to advance. With it. If you believe in evolution, evolution is moving forward. I don't agree, honestly. I think that some of these tribes would not want to advance and that tradition is more important to them. They yeah. can still keep tradition though. That's the thing. They can still keep their... We're not asking them to wear our clothes. We're not act, asking them to accept our culture. I'm talking about We're not asking technology. Them I'm talking about basic necessity technology. But like, the thing is, if they start using our technology, someone's some government, some agency, someone is providing that to them. So therefore, they're tied to the outside where there's no like, here's your Wi-Fi and we'll never talk to you again. Like yeah, that's basically yeah, if exactly. they, they're like, oh, well, you use our cool product you now are tied to us. You now mm -hmm. are, you know, we're kind of uh, your boss in a sense that like we can take mm -hmm. this away. You can, yeah. we can spy on you. We can do all these things. And I think that's their whole point of like, we don't right. want any, anyone to bother us. We want to do things the way that we've done them forever. Um, and whether that's for spiritual reasons or traditional reasons or many reasons, I don't yeah. know. But I think that if we start to bring in modern technologies that that's, that could really spoil what is what they find us so sacred to begin with yeah i completely agree and i think they would be like afraid of most of it and very resistant yeah which is why they wouldn't use everything but i'm sure there's something mm -hmm. that they would could find useful to them it mm -hmm. could be anything it could be it could be any gadget device maybe not talking about tv or necessarily the 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 poisonous technologies that have, we have introduced into our lives mm -hmm. the internet things like that i'm talking specifically about refrigeration things that would not impact necessarily mm -hmm. their cultural or spiritual beliefs that they could still continue but maybe it but would could for make all their we know. it could absolutely but what i'm saying is that it could also just enhance their lives with with allowing them to be healthier maybe their life expectancy goes up they're able to be cleaner they're able to you know live a more happy and fulfilling life because of these modern technologies mm -hmm. but also preserve the tradition and preserve the culture mm -hmm. and continue living into the future without you think if we could successfully communicate about that they would want those i things? i truly believe so i think if you could exp if there was a way to explain with no no strings attached and mm -hmm. this is purely to but see how do we explain no strings attached i don't know and i don't think I don't it would know. ever be no strings attached no no this is obviously well just yeah this is we're talking in a situation. theoretical world where you know people actually care about other people but yeah obviously that's not the case so yeah there it would there would probably be some type of effect to enacting this sort of change but i don't I'm just think they would want to trade theoretical sense. places with us really at all though Sometimes how corrupt I wake up and I'm is. like, I want to live like that. <laughs> Seriously. And I want to go like live in the More middle of the woods. More simple and connected. And, and yeah, know. just me and nature. Mm -hmm. Why don't and you go just, do it? I'm maybe one day, <laughs> maybe one day I'll run off to the woods. I, I just imagine how much better mm -hmm. their mental health must be. Health? <laughs> mental health. Their mental health must yeah. be. Yeah. No, I agree. I Without think all with this, all the distractions all and just nonsense and even just knowing about everything that happens in the world all the time, like the constant news cycle. And I think we're way you know. too plugged in. Yeah. And it's going to, I agree. Gonna, it's going to backfire on us, but I'll save that for another episode. Yeah. We could go on and on about this. We definitely want to hear your thoughts on, you know, these tribes and how we, you know, protect them, how they, do you think they ever could integrate with modern society in any way? Could they use modern things? Could we introduce things to them? Is there any point in doing that? Well, we did. We gave them iron. Yeah. So clearly we're, we're giving them something but when they're things, using yeah. them. So I think if that trend continued, I think it could help them and enable them to, yeah. to live well, longer, I definitely as long think as they're protected. Overall, so. I think the eyes on hands off approach is the way to go keep an eye on them as best as you can hopefully we have better technology to do that in a more discreet way um, but leave them alone i think that's crucial to their 
you and know, prosecute survival. these these people yeah. that don't give a shit and mm -hmm. make the punishments yeah. much worse much exactly. worse anyway definitely want to hear your thoughts on all of that that is going to be it for us this week you guys we will be back next week but until then keep on taking your mind 